Hello, and today we'll be looking at the certainty of objects requirement within the realm of trust law, um, but in relation to discretionary trust. So we've already had a look at the list certainty requirement for fixed trust when it comes to certainty of objects, which is one of the three certainties required in order for trust to be held to be valid. Now we'll be looking at discretionary trust. Discretionary trusts are different to fixed trust in that the who, uh, the who the beneficiaries are and or their entitlement is not fixed. What you have in the trust instrument is the criteria and the method by which um, these will become fixed by the trustee. And so uh, tr uh, discretionary trusts are important because during the middle of the last century, mainly for tax mitigation purposes, so using protective trust to keep capital and income from bankrupt beneficiaries creditors, um, it became very popular. And this is why, it why it's such an important um, aspect of trust law. Now, so if we start with the case of Reed Gest uh, Gestetner, 1953, um, this was a case concerning a power, and a power um, was different. is different to um, a discretionary trust in that the trustee over there just has a duty to survey the field of beneficiaries in, uh, and is no, under no obligation to distribute the trust property. And so using this reasoning, what um, Harmon J held in this case is that all that is required for a certainty of objects to be satisfied for powers is conceptual certainty, i.e. the idea that the concept, um, the criteria which determines uh, who is a beneficiary, who is not, must be sufficiently certain. And as we looked at in the fixed trust video, old friends was not, but relatives and dependents are. That's the idea where we're going with this. Now, um, at the same time, you have the case of R uh, IRC, and Broadway Cottages Trust, 1955. Now, over here, this case concerned a discretionary trust. And what it was held was that for discretionary trust, like fixed trust, you needed to have list certainty tests, i.e. conceptual certainty, evidential certainty, and um, uh, ascertainability. And this was because uh, for a long time, the courts assumed the only option was equal d um, division amongst the class, which as Lord Wilberforce later on points out, as we'll see, this is not always correct. So in effect, what they were doing was that they were treating the trust as if it were fixed. Jenkins, LJ in the Court of Appeal, he declined this opportunity to use the same test um, as the powers and, and he held the trust void for uncertainty. And so it was consistent with Harmon J's reading in uh, Re Gestetner. Then following on in Re um, Gulbeckian Settlements 1970, the House of Lords endorsed the Court of Appeal in relation to powers of appointment, saying that the objects were sufficiently certain using the conceptual certainty test, rejecting list certainty. And the Court of Appeal had uh, validated um, the powers by applying the one-person test. And in, in the obiter uh, regarding direct trust, it criticised um, Broadway cottages, which the House of Lords uh, basically um, rejected this uh, criticism by the Court of Appeal. So although um, you have this case of IRC and cottage trust, there's many problems with having different um, tests uh, for discretionary trust and powers. And the two key problems are, the first is that list certainty um, made tax planners reluctant to use discretionary trust. And the reason why this was a problem is because at least with discretionary trust, you know how to measure and how to what legislation to bring. If they weren't using discretionary trust because of tax purposes, what were they going to use instead? What were these other loopholes they were finding? So it was a bit of a problem. And in Public Trustee and IRC 1965 and Gartside 1968, the House of Lords pondered whether knowing the entire class gave rise to, uh, gave rise to estate duty uh, liability on the death of any one of them um, because they had awareness of this. And the second problem with having um, a different test was that the, val uh, the validity of the, the trust depends on really fine distinctions. So in Rees Sayer, the idea of empowered gave rise to a fiduciary power. But discretion in Rees Saxon in the same year uh, was a uh, void because it was a, it was deemed to be a discretionary trust. So it depends so closely on the wording. 
So this was another key reason why um, the whole IRC idea of list certainty for discretionary trust was overturned by MacPhail. So in MacPhail, there was a discretionary trust in favor of the employees of the settlers company, their relatives and their dependents. And the key question was surrounding relatives and dependents. It was accepted that the trust would fail for uncertainty of objects if you applied the complete uh, uh, list certainty. And so the validity of this trust depended on the House of Lords relaxing um, the list certainty test, which is precisely what they did. So Lord, Phil, uh, Wilbur, uh, or Lord Wilberforce giving the majority judgment, he emphasised the similarity between discretionary trust um, and powers. Uh, and, and he was saying that's why it's undesir undesirable to have differences because of these fine distinctions and it, it doesn't make any sense. He also remarked, as we um, mentioned earlier, that equal division was probably the last thing the settler wanted in these cases, um, just because that's not the nature of the trust we're looking at. So following Gulbeckian and MacPhail, a single test um, for certainty of object with regards to discretionary trusts and powers was um, founded. And this was an assimilation of the, of the um, Re-Getzner's uh, trust um, test, which is the is or is not test, which means that you only need um, conceptual um, certainty because you only need to be able to say whether that person falls into the class or not. But this was problematic because evidential certainty comes into this. How do we apply this? Whether some, you're saying somebody's in, in a class or not also relates to evidential certainty. So is this required was a key question. So this case, um, McPhail and Dalton, it was referred back to um, the High Court and um, it went on to the Court of Appeal as Reed Baden's Trust No. 2, uh, 1973. And all three judges, Stamp, Sachs, and McGow, they upheld the trust, right? So they didn't say it was uncertain, but we didn't get a uniform rationale. All three came at it from totally different perspectives. And this is what makes this really interesting to apply today. So let's have a look at, at how they applied it, because as you know, the central question isn't conceptual certainty, it's whether we need evidential certainty is that part of the is or is not test or is it not so stamp um lj of three judges he was the only one who took a very literal approach so he said it was necessary that you need conceptual and evidential certainty he and he was able to declare the trust valid because he said relative and dependent was conceptually certain because you know a relative could be restricted to the next of kin using the statutory um, definition of relative and conceptually you could um, deduce uh, evidentially uh, you could deduce whether a person was a relative or not you could use evidence and thereby it was fine it was upheld Sag Solje, on the other hand, he held that the test only required conceptual certainty. So similar to with powers. He said, where the facts are unsure whether the person meets a definition, this is the key thing, where you have the uncertainty, you just presume them to fall outside the class. So you don't have any uncertain people, don't know classes, because if they can't prove, if they don't have evidential uncertainty, then they just count as um, not being part of the class. So he was able to um, he was able to uh, uh, make valid the trust in Rebaden's trust because relative was he understood as descendants from a common ancestor, so it's conceptually certain, and then also you could use um, evidential uncertainty because whoever you did not know um, came from a conceptual uh, from a common ancestor, you just say no, they're not part of the class. So, um, given the present, uh, so the, 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 the criticism of this is actually for both Sachs and McGow was that you'll see what McGow had to say, or McGaw, um, was that they were both prepared to tolerate evidential uncertainty, some parts, both dealt with it differently. So, Sachs was saying that you just presume them not to be in the class, McGow said you can have some don't knows. We'll look at that in a second. But they tolerated no conceptual certainty. Now, this is problematic because either uncertainty, if you have, has the same result, which is that you can't say whether people are beneficiaries or not. So you kind of think, well, what is your rationale or logic or justification for this reason? 
And Sax LJ goes on to dismiss this problem because he says it's to do with the burden of proof. If you can't prove you're inside the class, you are automatically outside of it. It's it's not to do with me prioritising one type of certainty, it's to do with the law of evidence. It's totally different. So provided there's a clear concept to apply, uh, anyone who claims to be within the class has to prove on a balance of probabilities that they can. Those who are not, or those who we don't know, you just presume them to be outside of the class and they're um, excluded. McGaw, he offered a totally different perspective, and he was willing to tolerate a class of um, don't knows. He said the trust should be upheld if you can say a sufficient number of objects were in or in out. So if the majority, sufficient number of people, you can say whether they fall into the class or not, but there's some which you don't know, then it's fine. We can deal with that evidential uncertainty. That's fine. As long as the concept is clear. And actually, both McGaw and, and Sachs, LJ, you know, they, they, this kind of airy-fairy uh, reasoning that they've given um, is slightly flawed because they're saying uncertain objects are not members of the class to a certain extent. That is also what McGaw is saying. And this really has no real justification. Just because you can't prove you're someone's relative doesn't mean you're necessarily not their relative. It might mean that you, you are. So that was a, a bit of a problem with their reasoning. And then McGaw also felt that Stamp LJ's requirement of evidential and conceptual certainty <coughs> meant was equivalent to the complete list test. This is wrong because we also have ascertainability. But also, when you have the is or is not test, you're basically demanding the trustees when they're confronted with the individual to say whether they're in or not, it's a reactive trust. Whereas with list certainty, you're first drawing up the list and then you're saying, are they or are they not in the test? You need the whole list, list certainty in front of you. So McCord's understanding potentially too lax because of this idea of having don't knows and does it, what is a significant number. It's not making much sense. And another key thing is he didn't use a statutory definition of a relative. He was happy to take on this wider meaning of common ancestors, showing a bit more of a flexible approach as compared to Stamp. So where does this leave us today? Because even though we know that discretionary trust, you're not applying list certainty, but we don't actually know how to apply the is or is not test because all three judges applied it completely different, even though they got to the same result. So let's have a look at what we do know. We do know that there's some agreement for conceptual certainty. Actually, we know that all three judges, and if you don't have a conceptually certain um, uh, object, then I think basically the trust is not going to be held void. I think that's fair to say. Um, and uh, so the question to ask is, what if the courts had held that relatives was uncertain? Could the trust be upheld for employees' dependents, etc.? But I think, again, I would say, if you don't have conceptual certainty, you're not going to... That, 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 for me, is coming through clearly um, from McFarl and Rebaden's trust. Um, and if you do have a case where you have conceptual and, and evidential certainty, both of them, then you know the trust will be held valid. That's no problem. And then it's been suggested by Stamp LJ's approach um, that is most consistent with the test set down in the uh, Gopekian and McPhail. And McGowell's interpretation in particular is either, uh, either is, is, is um, contradictory um, to the way in which um, Gulbeckian and McFowl, um were made. And on this basis, looking at the previous case, you could say because Stamp J's judgment is more in line, he is a correct one. But actually, there's arguments either way because all three judges had equal standing in giving this judgment. So I think it's more to do with what you believe in and what you can argue the most. Thank you for watching.